If you have a Bible, do uh, open it again at Matthew chapter 12, uh, page 866 in the Church Bibles. Matthew chapter 12. Uh, I was waiting and waiting before deciding on my opening illustration this morning, uh, but I have it now. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to, to, to raise your hands. Who knows of the news story this morning about the volcano that erupted in Tonga yesterday? Uh, all right, if your hand remains down, could you describe what happened for me, please? Well, that's tricky, isn't it? <laughs> that's tricky, isn't it? It's pretty difficult, if not impossible, to speak of what you have not seen. In fact, it, it is impossible to speak of what you have not seen. Well, this morning, our passage is basically taken up with that kind of thing. Uh, you cannot speak properly of what you have not seen, spiritually speaking. You cannot speak accurately, truthfully, rightly of what you have not seen. Uh, our passage begins this morning, actually, with verse 22. I deliberately read in from verse 18 uh, through to verse 21, which was that passage from Isaiah uh, that was quoted by Matthew in the passage we looked at last week. And you'll, you'll see why I read that as we go along. But it actually begins with uh, a little story of a healing that Jesus did that would be very, very easy to just rush on by when you're reading through Matthew's Gospel. It, it seems pretty much just an incidental miracle. I say little miracle, there's no such thing as a little miracle, is there? But it's a short account of a great miracle that Jesus did. It begins, the passage, with a demon-possessed man. That seemed to be quite a common occurrence in Jesus' day, that there would be people who were demon-possessed. It's perhaps not something we come across very often in our own day and culture, uh, but it was something that happened a lot at the time of Jesus. There was a lot of demonic activity and opposition to his ministry, as you would expect. The Son of God has come into the world, and the devil wishes to oppose him. Of course, there was demonic opposition. But this particular demon-possessed man there's something very specific about um, the problems that the demon possession caused for him. Matthew is very clear to tell us that because he was demon possessed, he was blind and he was unable to speak. He was blind and he was unable to speak. As this passage goes on, it's going to tell us a lot about the words we say, about how we speak, particularly how the Pharisees spoke. But this little incident at the start that prompts the Pharisees to attack Jesus gives us an insight into what is actually going on. They can't speak correctly about Jesus because they, they are blind. They can't actually see who he is. They can't see who he is. This is a passage that is actually about blinded hearts that because they are blind cannot confess Jesus as Lord. And in the Pharisees' case, end up doing something very different instead because of their blind hearts. Let, let's just look a little bit more at that, that miracle, first of all, though, just very briefly, and then we'll, we'll work our way through the verses uh, that follow. I, I said it was important that we read, first of all, verses 18 to 21, which we actually looked at last week. And that's because I just want to pick up on one little detail that is in those verses. Uh, particularly in verse 18. Again, a little detail that's actually a big deal. Uh, in verse 18, uh, God the Father, speaking through Isaiah, then quoted 700 years later in Matthew, says this about Jesus. Here is my servant, 
whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. Those words, uh, they're, they're very reminiscent of words said from heaven when Jesus is baptised, if you remember those words. And what the Father says next is telling us what happened when Jesus was baptised. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. If you remember Jesus' baptism, the heavens open, the Father speaks, the Spirit descends on Jesus, and he begins his public ministry. And the Gospels uh, do emphasise uh, time and again that Jesus carried out his ministry here on earth in the power of the Spirit. What he did, he did by the power of the Spirit. Now that's not that he had no innate power in and of himself, but the Gospels make clear that he did it in the power of the Spirit. So, as he does this miracle, here in verse uh, 22, by whose power is he doing? Verse 22, then a demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to Jesus. He healed him so that the man could both speak and see. Now, if we've been paying close attention throughout all the Gospels as to how Jesus does what he does, says what he says, we know it's by the power of the Spirit. So, he heals this man so that he can speak and see by the power of the Spirit. And that, that informs then what begins to unfold in the following verses. Now, first of all, verse 24. When the Pharisees heard this, they heard about the miracle that Jesus had done by the power of the Spirit, although they didn't get that bit at the time. When they heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And now Beelzebub had been used here as another name for Satan. That's the way Jesus refers to Beelzebub as these verses move on. So, We'll get there, but perhaps you can see what the Pharisees, perhaps without realising it, are actually saying when they say, he drives out demons by Satan, the ruler of the demons. Uh, let's just have a quick look next of all at verses 25 uh, to 30. <clears throat> Jesus' big point in these verses is, well, that just makes no sense, just at a common sense level, to say that I've done this by Satan. So Jesus uh, knows what they're saying, knows what they're thinking, verse 25. So he tells them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. That's just a general truth, isn't it? Um, I do use football illustrations a lot, but I didn't like them. Uh, I remember a few years ago at a Champions League football match between um, Blackburn Rovers, this has gone back a bit, they've not been in the Champions League for a long time, and a team from Russia, one of the Moscow teams, I think it was. And um, things weren't going great for Blackburn Rovers, but they really started to fall apart when David Batty, their midfielder, started a fist fight with Graham Lasso, their left back. How do you think things went for the rest of that football match? Not well. Once the team turns on itself and they start fighting with each other, they're doing blackbird holes. And you can blow that up, of course, into much larger scales in world history than a football match. Every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. So he draws this conclusion. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Uh, underlying what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here is 
or you underestimate Satan if you think you do that. You, you must think he's not very clever, but he is. He would never do that. He wouldn't throw his own demons out of people. He wouldn't turn on himself. He's far wiser than that. This isn't being done by Satan. I'm not doing it by his power. Satan wouldn't do that. He knows he must remain united if he's to fight against God's kingdom. Verse 27, And if I drive out demons <coughs> by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons drive them out? Uh, there were exorcists uh, in that day amongst the Jewish people, and, and Jesus is saying, look, your own exorcists don't do it that way. What, what on earth makes you think I do? He said, they know that I don't. They will judge you. They will show you you're wrong if you ask them. For this reason, in verse 27, they will be your judges. No, that's, that's not what's happening, Jesus says. And he says, in the next verse, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon me. Well, that's Jesus saying what we've already said about that miracle that happens and prompts the Pharisees to speak as they do. I do this by the Spirit of God. All that Jesus did, he did in the power of the Spirit, including this miracle where he makes a demon-possessed man able to speak and see again. It's by the power of the Spirit. Um, incidentally, uh, this shows us that the battle that Jesus is engaged in is a, a spiritual battle. It wasn't just a, a physical one. Uh, we thought about that quite a bit last week. Um, about how Jesus healed those who were sick, and he did. Physical sickness, um, what might we say today is normal sickness, if you want to describe it that way, is a result of the fall. It is one of the out outcomes of sin that a cursed world suffers physically. But behind that again, there is a spiritual battle. Of course, there is. And Jesus was engaged in a spiritual battle. He goes on in verse 29. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Now, who do you think the strong man is in these verses? It's not Jesus, of course. It's Satan. Uh, and Jesus here is, again, is already had a go at the Pharisees for underestimating Satan's intelligence and, and wisdom, if you like. And now he's pointing out that Satan is indeed strong. And he is. Our spiritual enemy is strong. And this strong man, Jesus says, has a house with many possessions in it. What are those possessions? What are those possessions? Well, Jesus, in the miracle he has done, has freed one of those possessions. A man. <laughs> Satan's possessions are people. The Bible teaches us. And now that does not mean that every person who has not yet been set free by Jesus is demon possessed at this man. Uh, that's not what is meant. What is meant is, though, that everyone still belongs to him, unless they belong to Jesus. Uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, writing uh, just a, a few years later to the church in Ephesus, uh, speaks about the Christians in the church at Ephesus. Uh, you can turn to it if you want. It's uh, in the book of Ephesians uh, and chapter 2. Ephesians in chapter 2. He's describing what the Ephesians had been saved from by 
Jesus Christ himself. Here's what he says at the start of chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Who is that? That's the devil. And Jesus said, uh, Paul says to the church next, as you all once followed him, whether you knew it or not. Not necessarily you were possessed by him in the sense we normally think of that, but you belong to him. You were his possession in that sense. Now that sounds very strange to us, doesn't it? But it's an emphasis of the Bible time again. There are two kingdoms, there are two houses, if you like. There is God's house, and there is the devil's house. And spiritually speaking, which is the category that ultimately matters, everybody belongs to one house, one kingdom, or the other. And there isn't an in-between one where you belong to neither. The Bible makes that very clear. So how is anyone to be freed from the devil's house, the devil's kingdom, the devil's grass? How can someone enter a strong man's house, verse 29, and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Jesus is saying, I've I come to, to bind Satan, to tie up and release those in his grasp. That's what I come to do. I'm against it. I'm not working with him. And he says, anyone who is not with me is against me. There we have it. It's one of two things. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. It's a, a very clear refutation of what the Pharisees have said. Isn't it? But it really begins to hit home what the Pharisees have said. When we get to the next few verses, which are some for, for many Christians, and it tends to be Christians that they're troubling for, some of the, the most uh, frightening verses in the Bible. You ever read these verses and think, Ooh, what if that's me? But what is going on here? Jesus says in verse 31, Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Why does Jesus start talking about blasphemy against the Spirit? Well, think about what the Pharisees have just done in what they say. They said that the Holy Spirit is to be overlooked. Effectively happen. They've attributed the work of the Spirit not to the Spirit, but to the devil. Jesus casts out this demon. Jesus does what he does in the power of the Spirit, and the Pharisees say he's doing that by the Holy Spirit. That's why we reach 31 verse 31 and Jesus says what he says. That's why blasphemy is spent against the Spirit is being mentioned. That's what the Pharisees have done. They've attributed the work of the Spirit. Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. The Son of Man is Jesus himself. But whoever speaks against the Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the one to come. Does that scare you a bit? We're not used to speaking, aren't we, about the fact that Jesus forgives every sin. Yet here is a suggestion that we want sin to come. Our blaspheming the Spirit. Just on the, the positive side of things for a moment. It, 
It is astounding that Jesus will say, every blasphemy will be forgiven. If you were to think of the worst sins that could be, blasphemy is, is at the top, pretty much. But Jesus says, every blasphemy will be forgiven. Obviously, there's this exception, which we'll look at in a minute, but every other blasphemy will be forgiven. That's going to forgive the news, actually. There are other religions in this world where that really, really blasphemy is death penalty, that's it, no, no way back. But it's, it is forgivable by Jesus, because of it. And any other sin you can think of, that matter, and that's good news. I remember once, I think I've shared this story before, but a long time ago, I remember when I used to, to work um, for Job Centre Plus, I did work for Job Centre Plus one time, it's quite a few years ago now, and I would have people sit down in front of me who had, I'm sure, done some pretty terrible things. Some of them had just come out of prison and they were coming to claim the benefit. But I remember it, one sticks in my mind far more than anybody else. He must have been a man in his 60s. He just couldn't find a job. And he said, I don't want to tell people this, but this is why I can't find a job. I have a criminal record. I walked many years ago into the bedroom of my house and found my wife with another man. And I killed him. I didn't know quite where to put myself. I didn't. I can't remember what I said. I maybe didn't say anything, but just moved on. I don't know. He committed murder. He'd been to prison. Now he was out again. Just a year later, I was invited to preach in the town of the church in the town where I worked. I got up to preach. I was preaching on uh, Mark chapter 2. Uh, the man went down through the roof on a, on a bed by his friends into the room. Jesus, everybody expected him to say, get up and walk straight away because he can say, my son is in forgiven. My theme forgiveness. I sat in front of him. Was that man? There he was. I think he looked at me and I looked at him and we both gulped. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else in the room knew what he'd done. I guess he thought he'd never bump into me again. And there I was. I thought the same. I was able to say, whatever you've done, you can be forgiven. Doesn't mean he shouldn't have served a prison sentence, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean he can be forgiven. He can know life eternal. In God's kingdom. I, I don't know whether that man ever came to save me faith. My prayer is that he did. I've never bumped into him again since. But the gospel was for him, and it's for you. You can be forgiven any sin. And and yet there is this here. So let's let's keep going now to the next few verses. The next few verses, um, Jesus uh, talks about. Um, trees and the fruits that, that they bear. <clears throat> I was thinking of getting this to sing a song after the children's talk called Apples Don't Grow on Pear Trees. Uh, but I don't know, I, I sketched it. Okay, it's a children's song, uh, and many of you wouldn't have known it, and um, I didn't want to put that on us all. But um, here are the, the lyrics that go like this, and it, it helps to explain what Jesus says in these verses. Apples don't grow on pear trees, apples don't grow on pear trees. Apples don't grow on pear trees, no apples there, it only grows pears. The next verse is very similar. Bananas don't grow on plum trees, bananas don't grow on plum trees, bananas don't grow on plum, plum trees, no bananas there, they only grow plums. And then the chorus goes like this. Your heart is where the words of your mouth grow. Your heart is where the words of your mouth grow. Grow. Your mouth is where the thoughts of your heart go. Bit of tongue just ties, but let me say it again. Your heart is where the words of your mouth grow. Your mouth is where the thoughts of your heart go. Jesus, change our hearts to bear, to bear good. Let me read to Jesus a little parable. It's on the same thing. Jesus says, Either make the tree good 
and its fruit will be good. Or make the tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Speaking to the Pharisees still, he says, fruit of vipers. Now, incidentally, vipers are snakes. Snakes in the Bible are very often associated with the devil. He spoke to even the garden and warned the snake. What's he telling the Pharisees who decide they are actually wrong? Rude of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Let's ask a question though. What if the heart is blind? Remember, that's the, the miracle that this all started off with. A man who was unable to speak, and here Jesus is telling him, you can't speak it out of a, a heart that isn't good. But, but what if the heart is blind? It cannot see. It won't speak good of Jesus if it can't see Jesus. Jesus goes on, a good person produces good things from the storeroom of good, and an evil person produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. Well, they've spoken some pretty careless words, confusing the Holy Spirit of being the devil. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. The problem is, all of us have one heart still. That's the problem. If the heart is blind, if the heart is diseased with blindness, it won't produce good fruit. It won't speak rightly of Jesus, of God and the Spirit. <coughs> what is the solution? I'm not sure this passage, I think this is deliberate, um, actually gives us the solution in full. It doesn't mean the Bible does it. I, I believe the Bible does solve this for us. And I believe that that unforgivable sin that is spoken of about blaspheming the Holy Spirit is unforgivable for as long as it is committed. But it turns out the only one who can stop it from being committed is not you or I, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Um, I'd really love it if you turn to the next little passage we'll look at. It's uh, 2 Corinthians and chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, that's on page 1000. And 24, page 1024. I'm going to read quite a few verses uh, from this passage. Um, and this is the last bit we'll look at, if you like. Um, so we're not going to go on much longer than this. But let me read as, as Paul uh, talks, it's largely about the difference between the old covenant given by Moses and the new one that comes with. Jesus. But there's a lot of talk here about blindness and being able to see and the spirit. Uh, let's pick things up at the beginning of the chapter. Paul is writing to the Corinthians um, who are in danger of rejecting what Paul says. So that slightly explains why he starts as he does. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need like some letters of recommendation to you, you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that your Christ's letter delivered by us, not written with ink, with the first mention of the Spirit, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. The Spirit has done something in the heart. And such is the confidence we have through Christ before God. It is not that we are confident in ourselves to claim anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He has made us, uh, he has made us, competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not the letter, but of the Spirit. 
The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. He then begins to compare the old covenants, the one made through Moses, which was of the letter, and the new, which is of the spirit. Now, it's the ministry that brought death, because ultimately the law given through Moses brought death. It condemned people, no one can be made righteous through the law. Now, if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stones, came with glory, it might have brought death, but it was still glorious. If that came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory. So when Moses received the Ten Commandments and he came down at Mount Sinai, his face was shining. The Israelites didn't look at him. Pick up again. Uh, verse uh, 7, If the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, that old covenant has been set aside now, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious, the Old Covenant, is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory, the Spirit, the New Covenant that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, what did Moses used to do? He used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory that was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. They couldn't actually see it, even that lesser glory, because there was a veil over Moses' face. But to this day, Paul is saying, as he writes, but to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. People are blind, you see, they can't see the veil. The same veil remains. It is lifted because it is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil is over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, Veil is revealed. It's seen. I find the next verse very interesting. Verse 17. Now the Lord is, and you expect Paul perhaps to say, Christ. What does he say? Now the Lord is the Spirit. Ah, the Spirit and veils. So that we see. Now the Lord is the Spirit, as Paul is speaking here. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, he's talking about once the Spirit has made us see, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is the Lord who is the Spirit. Chapter 4, therefore, since we have this ministry, because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the road of the Lord, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by hope and display of the truth. But if our gospel is veiled, if people can't see it, why is it veiled? It is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds, and in the Bible, minds and hearts are often virtually interchangeable. In this case, their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. You see it? That, that tells us what's going on in our society. Uh, the God of this age in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 4 is the devil. And he has blinded people's minds 
and hearts have blinded the minds and hearts of Christ. Such that they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And that's that's unforgivable, at least it's unforgivable for as long as it continues. Because for as long as it continues, you will not see Christ and you will not be forgiven. But the very one who is being blasphemed, the Spirit, because he's the one in whom Jesus changes people and his power invades it, he is the one who unveils the hearts to their sin. And hurts. Everybody, until the Spirit works in your heart such that they see Jesus, has a blind heart. But we can't change our hearts. Interestingly, in verse 33, Jesus says, I will make the tree good and its fruit will be good, or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad. But who can change the tree? And in Jesus' illustration, the tree of the heart, who can change the heart? Only the Spirit. And the moment he does, we see Jesus. And we forgive him. Doesn't that make you thankful to God? Because the fact of us is, the fact is, we're all in an unforgivable position until the Spirit, or by the Spirit, show grace. And that's, it's about grace, isn't it? God's undeserved kindness to us. If you're a Christian this morning, whoever worries that you may have committed the unforgivable sin, have you asked Jesus to be forgiven? Because if you have, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't see Jesus in front of him if the Spirit had not won in your heart. You would not be rejecting the Spirit as the work of the devil if you want forgiveness in Jesus. Please understand that. If you ever worry about that. And if we see others committing that sin, does it mean they're lost forever? Well, it does unless the Spirit works in our heart. So what do we do? We pray. We pray that God would unveil the hearts of those whose hearts have been blinded by the Of course, we, we tell them about Jesus, yes, absolutely. We share the gospel, yes, absolutely. We love people, yes, absolutely. But we pray for the Spirit to work. Graciously, in the hearts of those who currently reject his work. I think I've really got there for one application this morning. God's people, we need to pray. We need to pray individually that God would work by His Spirit. We need to pray together that God would work by His Spirit, because without the work of the Spirit, we will not stop. And we'll remain so. They can't change their hearts. They can't get rid of their own blindness. But the Spirit can. <coughs> And we're living proof of this. Let's pray that he would work through all our pointing to Jesus to bring up this sight. So that they speak of Jesus as the only Savior. Should we pray? Father, once more we, we thank you this morning that you have sent your spirit into our hearts. You sent him there before we even asked for it. Because we wouldn't have asked for it. We'd have blasphemed it. But thank you in, the, in your grace and in your mercy, you did send your spirit so that we look to Jesus. So that we could be healed, forgiven, brought out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. So Lord, we, we pray by your spirit, please do the same for others. 
show grace and show mercy as you have to us. And we ask it for their good and for your glory. In Christ's name.